quiet down. We'll go ahead and get started. We apologize for starting late. Um, so that you are aware, we have uh, board member Garnica is on the phone. He is in uh, Canada right now, and he would like to participate. So um, he is in attendance there. Okay. Um, you want to let him know that it's posted and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, that was totally posted on the agenda at the very top. Those of you who weren't aware of it, tell us that he is in Canada. At his, at his location, the hotel where he's at. Okay, um, there are two, well, there's a, the item action that we have to report back in closed session. Um, first of all, we have uh, selected our new superintendent, uh, who you will meet shortly. And uh, the second item is that we will be, um, we have an action item to uh, accept his um, contract. So um, we'll go ahead and start the meeting. Uh, would everyone please stand for the flag salute? <laughs> Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Okay, um, we're going to have a motion to move an item on the agenda. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to move that we move item M17 to an item between, well, to G. Okay, as part of G, we are moving item um, M17, the approval of a superintendent's employment contract. We are moving that up to, uh, with his introduction uh, on G. Okay, uh, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, move the second to move the uh, agenda item. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, John. Okay, motion carried, five zero. Okay, um, so, okay, it gives, it gives me a, a great deal of pleasure and an honor to introduce our uh, new superintendent. As you all know, um, for the year 2014-2015, uh, and um, I know that first of all, I would like to thank all of you who participated in this process. Uh, this process started in January, uh, working with the Costco group who did an excellent job for us. And uh, with the input from teachers, parents, students, administrators, the whole community, um, we appreciate the uh, input that you gave us. And we really feel strongly that we've uh, selected the uh, absolute best candidate for our district. So at this time, I would like to just tell you a little bit about him. Um, he comes from uh, educational experience, which includes uh, his work in Ventura, Fresno, and Sacramento counties. He began his career as a bilingual classroom teacher and has held administrative positions as a middle school assistant principal, an elementary principal, a middle school principal, a high school principal, and currently as the Associate Superintendent of School Leadership and Support in the uh, Natomas Unified School District. He's a native of Ventura County and is a bilingual in Spanish. And uh, I, with that, I'd like to introduce our next uh, superintendent for the next school year. He will start July 1st. This is Dr. Adrian E. Palazuelos. I gotta tell you, I have a hard time with microphones. I'm just gonna turn around if that's okay. First off, to the trustees, 
Thank you for the opportunity to serve the Fillmore community. I'm very excited and honored that you would select me. And I can tell you right now that our commitment to ensuring that we do the best for students is aligned. And we're going to do that in our work. Um, if you don't mind, a los padres y otras personas aquí que hablan español, me da mucho gusto de estar aquí presente con ustedes, uh, de tener una mesa directiva que tiene los uh, mejores intereses de sus hijos, en, primeramente en la mente, que uh, quiero darles la gracia y más a todo el apoyo que me han dado. Y arriba Fillmore. Adelante Fillmore. Thank you guys. Uh, your wife is here, I believe, and your children? Absolutely. Okay. You know, you can't forget the supporting cast, yeah. correct? Yeah. So I'm very fortunate tonight. I have my uh, I have my wife, Julie, in the back. I have my three daughters, uh, Isabella, <laughs> Olivia, and Nadia in the back, because they're waving. Um, <laughs> all three of them will be enrolling here in Fillmore Schools, and, and I hope they know somebody to get them enrolled in the right schools. So. <laughs> Richard and Rosa Palazuelos, they made the journey from Oxnard out here to be with us. <laughs> and another one of Tony Simon's going to be with us as well. Thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you. And uh, I know that you're, you're planning the venture of uh, settling in the community, I believe. Absolutely. Is that correct? Yes. Absolutely. Very good. So uh, we will be having um, uh, a, an introduction uh, type meeting with him uh, where we will invite uh, all stakeholders so that you get to uh, meet and talk to Dr. Uh, Palazuelos and then uh, you know you could express your concerns. But I'm sure he's gonna be in and around town so to say hi to him and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Okay, moving on to uh, item H, recognitions. We have the celebration of migrant speech and debate students and coaches, and I believe, uh, no. Uh, no. no? Oh. Guys, do I have so Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, so now we have action item, M17, excuse me on that, got so excited. Um, approval of the superintendent's employment contract. Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> moved it, and Dave Weil second that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, 5 0. So, again, congratulations, uh, Mr. Dr. Paul Esquilas. Okay, um, now we move on then to the recognitions, celebration of migrant speech and debate students and coaches. And I think uh, Mrs. Vidas. Good evening, Dr. Nishino, um, Mr. Johnson, Dr. Valenzuelos, welcome. We hope that you do a wonderful thing for our migrant student. We're looking forward to working with you. Um, board members, parents, audience, I'm here today to talk about my migrant program. I'm very proud of this program. And I know um, you may or may not know that I was a migrant student growing up. So when I was a kid, every summer, I would go to the fields and work with my parents. We would be great. And in high school, I would go to the packing houses and, and um, sort tomatoes. So I really look forward to working with these students because that's at my roots. That's what I came from. And I'm really proud to be able to represent them in the migrant program. Um, I'm Diana Vidas. I'm the coordinator of the migrant program. I'm also the proud principal of Pyro Elementary. And so I'm blessed to be able to do both of these things for the district. And I feel very strongly in all of the programs that I run. Today, I'm going to be fo focusing on the migrant program. Um, one of the things that my parents always emphasized for me was education. That was always such a big thing. And so I always got good grades. And one thing for me was that I didn't go looking for the university. The university came looking for me. So as a high school kid, I had UC Davis come to my campus and recruit me. And they facilitated everything so that I can go to their campus. So 
So now, as the head of the migrant program, it's a privilege to me because our, our mantra for the migrant program is we're going to send migrant students to college. And everything that we do, all the messages of every program that we have is the same. What are we going to do for migrant students and how are we going to send them to college? Um, we have special, uh, lots of events on Saturdays and we bring in parents and we talk about what they need to do to support students so that they can send them to college. All of the programs that we run, our emphasis is always the same. Um, our past program helps students recoup, recoup units for students that may have had some kind of, of stumbling block. And the past program helps them work towards recouping those units so that they can graduate and hopefully go to college. We have our homework centers, which support students in doing well in high school and in school, um, helping them in their homework. We have our Even Start program, which works, works with, our earth, with our young migrant students from two to seven years old. This year there was a, a change. I restructured the program in the past, and I think you've all heard that we used to provide English classes for parents. And this year we had to restructure due to Common Core and due to all of the new requirements. So now what we do in the Even Start program is we work with parents to support students in elementary and to give them the, that edge that they need for Common Core. So that's been a shift for us, us this year as well. We have so many other events that we do. We do ESTE, which works on technology and uh, focus on engineers. We have a College for a Day, where we take parents to college as well as parent, uh, our students. And uh, parents get to experience what it is to go to college for a day. They work with the, the staff from the university and get all their questions answered. We have computer camp where students go for several days and they're submersed in technology and then they come home with a, a new laptop. So that's really nice. We also have our Migrant Summer Leadership Scholarship Institute where students go for several weeks and they are completely submersed in that um, college experience so that they understand what are the needs and how they can get there. Currently, we're running our SPARK program, which is a program for 6th through 8th grade, 6th through 12th graders, and the whole focus is what do you need to do to get to college? What can you do to excel in your high school classes? And what is the process to get you to college, the whole entrance um, process, everything that they need. So always our focus is the same. What are we going to do for migrant students and how are we sending them to college? So I feel very fortunate to be at the head of this program because I run two programs, which is Pyro Elementary School and the migrant program. I would not be able to do it without the exceptional staff that I have. And I have some, some very strong people working for me. I have Isabel Ramirez. She is our recruiter and she's our bread and butter. And her job is to increase those numbers because without her, we cannot move forward. I have Norma Magana, which works with our Even Start program, which are with our young students, and she does a phenomenal job. This year that we restructured the program, I have teachers coming up to me and telling them, telling me what a, a change, what a positive change they see in the students because Norma is now going to the houses and helping, helping parents to know what they have to do to nurture um, education for their students. So those are a little bit of the things that we're doing. The reason that I want to take the time to tell you about this is because, um, sadly, the migrant program is in crisis. Um, in the past, as you all know, to be a migrant basically meant they went looking for work, and they went from place to place. They were able to change employers, and the reason for the migrant program was because as parents moved around, there needed to be some support for students. So that's all changed. Lifestyles have changed. And even though parents now move to find jobs, typically they leave their families behind because it's not feasible for them to move. So because that's happening, our program is in jeopardy. And our numbers are dwindling. And as our numbers dwindling, so do the funds that we have. And so we are in crisis. And it's very important that 
right now that we have the support of Mr. Mendoza and that he's helping us, we take advantage of all of the programs that we offer. And that's why my staff this year is voracious about making sure they sign our kids up for everything and support us in everything. So I think that um, hopefully you're very proud of the work that we've done because I am certainly very proud. I want to announce my right hand. I would not be able to do it without this lady, which is Maria Gonzalez. If you please stand. for the migrant program. She is the biggest cheerleader for migrant students and she has had her students go through the program and it is really a pride to be able to work with her because she, she helps me do everything that I need to do. So without ado, um, what I'm here for today is to feature some of my students that I have here. These students um, were part of two different competitions. We have our speech and spelling, which is for our fifth grade students, and then we have our speech and debate and that's for students 6 through 12. These students work with their coaches, and we have one of our coaches here today, Jennifer Fitzpatrick, if you can please stand. <laughs> we have Michaela Gorman, which was another one of our coaches, and um, we have several other coaches that worked at the elementary school. We have Tammy Ferguson, I don't know if you're in the audience. We also have one more coach. Mary Ellen, thank you. Mary Ellen uh, Garcia, are you in the audience? Okay, so these ladies worked hard. So what they do is a couple weeks before the events, they work with our students and they help the students come up with speeches and students work hard. They need to prepare one speech that they take to the to the competitions and that's the prepared speech when they get there the second round is there they're given a topic and they give them about 10 minutes to prepare a second speech and that's the extemporaneous speech so all of these young ladies have gone through that process and they what we do is we take them to the region and we compete with all of the schools in the region so they compete with ventura santa paula Oxnard and all the neighboring schools and um, we're very proud that we have so many trophies coming back. That means that they're doing a great job and we're really proud of them. Um, we're going to start this evening before I introduce all of them with uh, some of the winners from the, the speech and spelling competition and speech and debate and they're going to present their speeches to you. We're going to start with um, one of my Pyro students, Jimena Cortez, and she was the winner, first place, in fifth grade combined prepared and accepting a speech. So Jimena, why don't you come on up and, and read your speech to us. Anyone. Their comments should be kept to themselves. 
It's all about love and care for everyone. From my research and personal experience, I conclude that any student who bullies should be expelled from school. Students should feel protected showing up to school and not to be afraid. Everyone should understand that bullying is wrong. We need to stop. It's up to us to stop the bullying. If you or someone you know is being bullied, please help. Next, we have Anaí Pascual. She placed first, first place in sixth grade combined prepared and extemporaneous English speech. She's a sixth grade student at Fillmore Middle School. Anaí. Michael wanted me to mention that this young lady that's coming up has a truckload of trophies and uh, she polishes them every night. So anyway, <laughs> we have next up, um, we have our 10th grader from Fillmore High School, Yunisa Fregoso. She placed uh, first place in 10th grade, prepared an extemporaneous speech, and Yunisa will be one of the people that represent us in state competition. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Yulisa Fergoso and I am a sophomore at Fillmore High School. In the newest CoverGirl commercial, Ellen DeGeneres says, Girls can't. Sometimes you feel it, but most times you hear it. I like it when people say I can't do something. Be courageous. Girls can't? Yes, they can. I believe that a girl can do anything she sets her mind to. And if a woman wants to fight in combat, let her do it. Every woman should be allowed to fight in frontline combat. First of all, this is the 21st century. Everybody, welcome to the 21st century. Not allowing females to fight in combat would be taking a step back into the sexist era. 
Let's all stop and rewind to a time when Susan B. Anthony was marching down cities, town, state for her, for her ideas to be heard. She wanted equality for the female gender. It all started with a vote that changed the history of humanity forever. Also, there's plenty of brave women like Rosa Parks, Marriott T Mother Teresa, Amelia Earhart, and Harriet Tubman who set the example for the female that we were much more than just a gender. Even though in a recent study done by the Pentagon, less than 8% of women would actually join frontline combat, that's about one in 10. Why would our country take the opportunity of that one woman that would risk her life for the American flag? It only takes that one out of 10 to change the world, to change humanity, to save her people and her country. It should be clear to every, everyone that every woman in the military is contributing to our country being safe. Opening combat to all genders would allow hundreds if not thousands of frontline positions to open up within the next year. And the pen, if the Pentagon made a decision to open these positions, more than 200,000 jobs would be opened. So tell me, with all, the ben, with all these benefits, why would anybody want to keep women from front lines? After all, who rules the world? Girls. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations to everybody. As you can see, board members, this is not an easy task. They have to research, they have to put a speech together, and then that's only step one. Then they have to talk, decide how they're going to present, put in movement, and then have that winning attitude that's so important for, for them to get ahead. So now we will present all of the students that participated, and then uh, at, the, at the end, I will let you know which one of these students are going to state and we have uh, five students that are going to the state competition in uh, Santa Maria, and they will represent us well, and I'm sure they're gonna come back with more trophies. Okay, we're going to start with a speech and spelling tournament. These are our fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade students. We had one student um, place. This is Jimena Cortez. Congratulations, she's a Paris student. And in our speech and debate tournament, which is for students 6th through 12th grade, we had several winners. We had lots of winners on that, at that competition. Um, we, we're going to start with 6th grade. All of our 6th grade students were new to this competition, so we're very pleased that they were able to place first time around. Um, Anaí Pascual was our first place winner. Giselle Perez, second place, 6th grade. Amy Ramos, third, third place, sixth grade, combined prepared to December your speech, and she didn't come this evening. Diana Perez, third place, seventh grade, combined prepared in extemporaneous English speech. This is Amy Ramos. Then we have uh, Fillmore High School, and the coach for these young ladies was our coach Jennifer Fitzpatrick. Montserrat Infante did her speech in Spanish, and she plays first place for the country. Yulisa Fregoso, first place, 10th grade, combined prepared and extemporaneous speech. Finally, yes, Jessica Cortez, first place, 12th grade, combined prepared and extemporaneous speech.
Last thing, I'm just going to recognize that there's some students going to state competition. So um, let's go ahead and recognize them. Anaí Pascual, if you can just stand. Yulisa Fregoso, Jessica Cortez, Montserrat Infante. So these young ladies will be going accompanied with Ms. Fitzpatrick. They will be going May, um, May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and they will be competing with all of the migrant students in the state on speech competition. So we wish them well. Intending to be league champions, they won their last game against Santa Clara, 16 to three. Uh, also, ASB has set our Make a Wish walk for April 30th, and that will be held at the high school track. And a, we had a beautification day that was last or, last Saturday, and uh, students were able to volunteer and help clean around um, the FHS campus. And right now in ASB, the juniors are working on the upcoming prom that is set for May 10th at the Satakoy Country Club. So. Good. Yep. Right. Thank are you getting ready for Tennessee? Slightly. Yes, I'm yes. putting it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Kiana. And now we have our superintendent's report. I just have one item. I'm pretty proud of this. We're sending a team down to Coronado on May the 10th. Unfortunately, it's a prom night, so not all our students can participate. But we're going to, to a SEAL challenge. There'll be 11 school districts throughout California that'll be competing down in San Diego corridor at the SEAL compound. And uh, the kids are really excited. It's uh, once in a lifetime for many of them to be able to go out there and not only compete, but to see where, to actually be where the SEALs train. Out there. So they'll be doing obstacle awesome courses, they'll be doing uh, swimming, they'll be climbing ropes, sit-ups, push-ups, all the activities that the physical activities that the SEALs have to participate in. And one of the key things about this, and the SEALs will tell you this, is not the best athlete or the smartest kid that usually makes it, it's the person with the most determination and really works hard to get there. And that's what they, hopefully our kids will learn from this. It doesn't matter what you do in life, be the best. If you're going to be a cook, be the best cook. If you're going to be a doctor, be the best doctor. If you're going to be an engineer, be the best engineer. It doesn't matter what you do. And if you don't give up, I can almost guarantee you're going to be successful in life. And that's what we want to teach our kids. That you don't give up, you work hard, you set your goals. And they talk about that all the time, about setting goals and achieving. Because if you have no target, you surely won't hit it. So you have to have a goal. And we are so proud of them, there's seven of them. And I'll be talking to uh, Martin's, they're all over there about getting pictures of them before we go down there. And uh, they're already getting all together, trying to get the uniforms together, how they're gonna represent Fillmore. So they're creating something. When I talked to the, uh, the head guy, he said, uh, make it as great as possible, they're outside the box. So they want them to be created. So I'm not gonna tell Miss Morielle who will be going with us because she really did the first competition here locally to uh, really do some really good things for our kids. And I'm really proud of them and I'm proud of the parents that are allowing them to go. I'm trying to find out how many parents we can take with us, how many we can get down there because um, some of them do want to go because it'll be once in a lifetime for them too to see this. Not everybody gets to go and be in the compound. So they're trying to make those arrangements right now and I'm calling them up. So they're tired of being pestered them, so hopefully we'll be able to take some parents. Um, Mr. Johnson, I know you have a lot on the agenda. Do you have anything you want to share real quickly? I believe I'll wait until uh, my portion is up. Okay. Um, Dio, got anything? 
Okay, Todd? Uh, yes, Dr. Shino, I'm very pleased to announce that we have closed contract negotiations with both FUTA, the teachers union, and CSEA, the classified union. And upon ratification and board approval, the board will be authorizing uh, a well-deserved salary increase as part of that uh, closing of the contract negotiations. Um, all of our employees work very hard and uh, we want to show what we can uh, in their appreciation. And I want to thank both teams, uh, negotiating teams for CSEA and FUTA and the district. We put a lot of time uh, going back and forth and I want to thank them for resolving the issues that we had and uh, being able to settle this early so that we can uh, move forward. Now as a teacher one, Todd, going to be a three-year contract, correct? Yes. And, and CSEA? Is, uh, just this year. And then just we'll, this year. We have right. openers for next year. Okay. This was one of the most cooperative ones we've seen, where people really understand where we are. Even though there is going to be new money on the plate, you know it doesn't come all in one year. It's going to take seven years to get the money that they promised us. And a lot of that's predicated upon Prop 30 money, Prop 30 being passed again. So if it isn't passed, that means the money will disappear. You know, we've uh, they've been able to, uh, to give to us. So when it comes up for renewal, just think about the things that we've been able to do uh, to compensate our employees, which they deserve, while also not sacrificing programs for kids. So um, thank you, Todd, for working so hard with the with both organizations and uh, getting here. Thank you. Okay, and I just uh, want to thank uh, Dr. Machino for doing uh, that for our uh, group of students that are representing our high school, for taking them down to the, uh, the Navy SEAL competition. So uh, good luck to you. No. <clears throat> okay, item J, public comment on agenda items and non-agenda items. This is the time and place to address the school board. State law prohibits the board from acting on issues not included on the agenda. However, requests may be made for discussion of specific topics at subsequent meetings. On recognition by the president of the board, please come forward and identify yourself before speaking. The Board of Education reserves the right to, a, to limit speaking time to three minutes or less per individual. Okay, are there any more cards out there? I have the ones that were out there, okay. Uh, first speaker, uh, Sherry Wright. Good evening. First off, I would like to clarify Mr. Prado's half-truth that he published in the Gazette about me. At the March 18th board meeting, as I sat quietly in the audience, I was respectfully asked a question by Mr. Wilde, which I answered. In Mr. Prado's letter to the editor, he states that I, a high school parent, spoke up that I had not been asked. If not in attendance at that meeting, the reader would have a distorted version of what actually occurred. I did not express my opinion freely. I was asked a question and I answered and there was a difference. At your last board meeting, I listened to a presentation given by Mr. Johnson's department on an important topic in our district, bullying. The presentation covered the three key pieces to bullying, the aggressor, the victim, and the bystander. What I witnessed the night of March 18th was Mr. Prado being a bully. I feel he was irritated that my answer to Mr. Wilde's question did not support Mr. Messman's false statements in his last presentation. Mr. Prado, who was acting president in Mrs. Wright's absence, became assertive in his questioning. He, without any explanation of his expectation of me on a WASP committee, wanted me to commit and give him an answer on the, on the spot. That is a bully. When I watched how he acted and listened to how he spoke to Mrs. Asham, I believe he was also annoyed that her statements did not support Mr. Messman. The way he treated Mrs. Asham that night and in his written statement to the Gazette is like a bully. His newspaper statement stated that his only Brown Act violation was in cautioning her to not make comments or speeches. That is untrue. Mrs. Asham was never called on to speak after turning in her speaker card. She had to stand and ask to be called upon. That is also a violation of the Brown Act. So clearly his assertion that he had one issue with the Brown Act is in his words a mistruth. I want you to know, Mr. Prado, that I do not support what I perceive is you being a bully. We are all here actively pursuing what we feel is best for our kids and their education, so please respect that. What I hope the board learns from my example in speaking tonight is that it is not okay to be a bystander. You, the other board members, become the bystander when you allow the speaker to be bullied and you remain silent while it is occurring. I hope in the future that you are empowered to do exactly what you are expecting of our students, to speak up and stop it while it is happening. 
The final thing I want to address is the racism insinu insinuated in Mr. Prado's letter. As you can see, I am white, and those that know my family know that my kids are white. And by the way, in our community, we are clearly a minority. I also am not racist. What I want you to understand and what I want to clarify is that Mr. Messman and Dr. Nishino are not being judged on their color or their race. They are being judged on their ability to run our schools and more accurately and importantly, their ability to destroy our schools. I would like to say thank you to Mrs. Asham who has lived in our community and slept at Thousand Oaks for almost 30 years. I appreciate her courage to fight for our kids and our schools. Her outside opinion is not any different than that of Mr. Prado who continually refers to his time in Moore Park, yet he lives in Fillmore. It certainly is far different from the woman who drove down for the last meeting from the San Jose area. If you recall, she spoke to defend what the current administration is doing. Yet she has never been in our high school and she told me she has never talked to a staff member or a student in our district. If so, who is feeding her information about our district and what to write and speak about? Was she encouraged to stay out of Fillmore, take her criticism of those not supporting Mr. Mespin back to Campbell, California, make the best of her retirement and enjoy her life? My guess is probably not. In closing, I would like to say that I hope this recent issue also presents a clearer picture of exactly why staff, parents, and students are not comfortable coming forward with issues. It is this type of mistreatment and public humiliation that prevents people from feeling comfortable expressing criticism. Even if done in a respectable and polite manner, as Mrs. Ashton has done, you risk being retaliated against and personally attacked. If you don't believe me, read Mr. Prado's letter. It should be very clear why current employees who depend on their salary and their benefits have not come forward.
long as you were up. Go ahead. If someone could make the announcement that we have a copy of our speech in Spanish for anyone that could you make the announcement in Spanish that we have a copy of it? Uh, la señora Hoffman quiere dejarles saber que tienen una, una copia de su letra en español si hay algunos de ustedes que quieren esta copia. Sorry, I, I got emotional because I saw Isela who was my student and um, oh, have a hard time. Otherwise I was good. Sorry. It's okay. I'm speaking on behalf of a group of teachers at the high school. Although I am the speaker, please keep in mind that I am one of 24 teachers who deliver this public comment. Each teacher's name will be read at the end of this statement. This statement is mainly in response to a portion of Mr. Prado's letter in the Gazette, specifically concerning the part where he accused Mrs. Asham of being the gatekeeper in deciding which students will, quote, have the opportunity to take advanced placement honors or college prep courses, unquote. Mr. Prado describes how many, quote, many times this woman has denied students the opportunity to challenge themselves, unquote. Mr. Prado dismisses the fact that some students do not have the skills to function in those higher level courses by calling it an excuse, because he goes on to explain, quote, too often teachers want the best of the best in those higher level courses, in essence, depriving opportunity, especially minority students and thus the advocate for those students should be the counselor. This statement is offensive and disrespectful. The intention does not matter as much as its implication because Mr. Prado was writing as a school board member. How the statement is and was perceived does matter. Mr. Prado's statement implies at best that there is a culture of racism being practiced by counselors, AP and honors teachers at our school. At worst, it implies there exists institutionalized racism. Both are inexcusable, and we cannot let it go without comment. The message is perceived to be AP and honors teachers are turning away minorities, and thus it falls to the counselor to be their only advocate, because the teachers too often are not. If the practice of racial preference is truly believed by Mr. Prado to be occurring, then there should have been research, including quantitative data. There should have been formal and informal inquiries, which include looking at prerequisites for AP courses, or even discussions about prerequisites. There should have, sorry, there should have been discussions with the teachers of those courses, as well as parents and students. Such an inflammatory accusation, an accusation based on personal conversations and hearsay, should not be made by a trustee of our schools. Stakeholders, teachers, students, and parents should not have to be informed of a school board, school board member's opinion of this magnitude via the newspaper. We are horrified to imagine how the parents and students who don't know us will or did react. If Mr. Prado did not, does not believe there is a culture of racism being practiced at our school, then as a member of the school board, he should have not been so careless with his use of incendiary words by writing something that so casually implies racism in order to back up or prove a point. Additionally, we feel his decision to use the word lynching was totally inappropriate. Either way, as a member of the school board, Mr. Prado should not have written that letter. To Mr. Prado, you have undermined the integrity of great counselors, great teachers, and a great AP honors program. Many of our students have read your letter. They're talking about it, and we are all having to deal with it because they picked up on the implications as well. You added to the problems we face as a school and as a district. Your letter was not a positive, proactive step toward any type of solution. You have not solved anything, nor proven anything. What you did do, however, was this. You wrote a letter flaunting your disrespect for Mr. and Mrs. Asham, while also accusing teachers and Mrs. Asham of racism. You acted in such a way that this board, including yourself, would never tolerate from a teacher or a classified employee. 
you have brought shame and embarrassment to this district. Sincerely, in alphabetical order, Norm Anderson, Wayne Bauer, Alyssa Byrne, Matt Dollar, Jennifer Fitzpatrick, Cinda Francis, Curtis Garner, Deborah Hoffman, Nietzsche Huxtable, Lourdes Juarez, Mark Kendall, Stephen Kendall, Jeremy McMahon, Roz Mitzemacher, Josh Overton, Brian Rickards, Darby Shefferly, Aaron Seebeck, Mark Seebeck, Matt Suttle, Trina Tafoya, Kim Tafoya, Dina Wyatt, Tim Waddell. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Mark Kandel, a teacher at Fillmore High School. I've been asked to read a letter from a 2013 graduate of Fillmore High School. Dear FUSD School Board, my name is Jose Luis Perez. I am an alumnus of Fillmore High School class of 2013. I write to you about recent occurrences that have been brought to my attention. I am currently a student at California State Polytechnic University of Pomona with a major in mechanical engineering and minor in materials engineering. I would like to go on record that I have nothing to gain from this because my life as a Fillmore student ended the day I graduated. I am writing this letter because I am a bit disgusted by how Mr. Prado has talked about Mrs. Ashen. While attending Fillmore High School, Mrs. Karen Ashen was my counselor and always tried to steer me into the right path, even though I did not see it at the time. I would also like to point out for Mr. Prado that I am fully Mexican, born to parents that came from Mexico. I know Spanish fluently and took AP courses while attending Fillmore High School. Wait. Many of you may think I am being dishonest because, according to Mr. Prado, Mexicans are not allowed to take AP courses because Mrs. Ashton doesn't approve of them being in the course. Well, I would like to have you know that while attending Fillmore High, I took a total of nine AP honors courses and two college level courses. When I read the letter that Mr. Prado wrote, I was shocked and disgusted. I was shocked on how little he really knows Mrs. Ashen and disgusted on how he could talk to her like that. I say this because I feel that Mrs. Ashen does not really know how much she contributed to what I am now. If it was not for Mrs. Ashen, I feel I would not have had as much success in mechanical engineering as I have come to have. When the class of 2013 wanted an AP physics class, for our senior year, it was Mrs. Ashton who made it happen and supported us. When I made the choice of skipping AP Calculus AB and going straight into AP Calculus BC, it was Mrs. Ashton who gave me support and encouraged me to do well, even though I had to teach myself the material from the class I skipped. If Mrs. Ashton had not helped in these two matters, then I would not have the success I have today. With the help of Mrs. Ashton and all the expert advice she gave me, I am currently considered a third year at Cal Poly Pomona, even though it is my first year at this university. It's funny how in the moment you truly don't understand how much one person can shape your life. I hope Mrs. Ashton is in the room while this letter is read because I would just like to truly thank you from the bottom of my heart because if it wasn't the service that you provided to all the students at Fillmore High School, then many of us would not have the success that we have today. I would like to thank the FUSD School Board for allowing my letter to be read at this meeting. I only apologize that I could not be there in person to read it. But unfortunately, I had classes and could not attend the meeting. 
To Mr. Prado, next time, mind your own business. And if you want to get it to others, then please get your facts straight. To Mrs. Asham, thank you for everything you have done for me. Sincerely, Jose Luis Perez. Hello, um, my name is Kathy Frias, and just as a brief introduction, I am a parent of a senior currently and one that graduated last year. I have been on school site council for approximately 12 years, and also I have served on a commission uh, for the city of Fillmore. So the reason I state these facts to you now is because I want you to know that I am very familiar with your type of situation. Very familiar. Many times we have people that come to us as a community of board and they approach not understanding that sometimes we don't have all the material necessary. I understand that. However, I do want to say that every time someone approached me on my commission, I always looked at them directly, and I was never rude to them. I looked at them, I did not look down, I did not look at papers, I looked at them. And I think what you're seeing here with all this response is the fact that people in film or students, teachers, are not feeling or being feeling that they're being reciprocated that you are hearing what they're trying to tell you. Many have sent you emails, myself included in the past years, and they have gone with no response. A simple, thank you for your email, I will get to it, would be very much appreciated. So I'm not saying all of you have behaved in the same manner, but I have been to a few board meetings, I have myself um, sent emails, and they have not been responded to. And you know, what it comes down to the whole thing is, we need to learn to respect each other. And that is what is not happening in our district. And quite frankly, it saddens me. Um, there's a part of me that is glad that my son's gonna be leaving because I will not have to myself personally put up with this anymore. But for the future, and I know there are two seats coming up, and I do hope any of you out there that are considering running to please Always be open to those that are coming to speak to you. Always try and listen. Always get your facts straight. Always try, and even though you don't like what they're saying to you, just sit there, listen. At least try to do that. In other words, have some manners. That's the bottom line, the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. And so in closing, uh, with regards to the high school principal, I personally tried to do my best with working with him, he was new, I understood that. But we all have to wrap ourselves around the new superintendent and whoever the new high school principal is going to be. And whoever is going to be going into school, site council for the high school, I encourage parents, please, we need you parents, because it's always the same ones that keep coming and it's getting a little tiring, quite frustrating to be frank. And we need parents. If you think you don't know what it is that's going on, you will learn. It's not that difficult of a concept. So I really do hope by putting this out there, there are three of us that are now leaving the school site council at the high school. We need parent support. We needed teacher support. As soon as we got teacher support, things started moving. We got the budget moving. We got a wish list going. We need you though. Don't keep standing in the background leaving it for the few of us parents that are just doing it. You need to all participate. So having said that, the look I'm, I'm looking for the new high school principal, and if I might make a suggestion, it should be very similar to that superintendent of ours, because they, there's a lot of similarities that are needed in the superintendent that are needed in the high school principal. So thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Adrian Ramon, I guess he took off, and I want to be the first one 
or one of the first ones to welcome him. Because I guess, as you see, he's got energy. And I, and I think he's going to have the interest. And you see right away, um, I've been a supervisor before, and they say you can tell right away in the first five minutes what kind of person he's going to be. And I think this guy's going to be a good superintendent. But I just wanted to ask him, you know, I know, I don't know if he's going to be there at the, at the front doors of the high school this coming uh, beginning of the year, but I hope he's, he, somebody tells him, if I don't come up to him and ask him, I hope you guys can ask him to be in front of the high school, not only the high school, but the rest of the schools around the district. Because he needs to be seen, and I know he will do that if he's told to, because every single student should see him, and if he could try to see every single student in the district. And uh, I, hate, I hate to say this, but Mr. Mesman was very respectful for me, my son Tyler, and my son and my daughter Caroline. He was out there at lunch. I don't know what happened in the past, but Mr. Mesman respected me, my son Tyler, my daughter Caroline. And I had, uh, you know, uh, the first day that he had a um, uh, meeting with the parents, one, one uh, parent asked him, can you be here in three years? We need people like him that has that enthusiasm. I don't care what people have done in the past. I mean, I, in a way, you do want to care. But why not give it a, a, a person a second chance? You know, there's a lot of inmates that, that we, we, you know, they, they served their time and they, done, they came back to the community and done well, you know. But all I want to say is that, that uh, uh, this lady just came up right now. I have an interest. When my son Tyler and my daughter Caroline leaves high school, I'm going to be a parent that has an interest for as long as it takes here at Fillmore. Because I'm going to help these kids. I'm not here because my, my son Tyler was in the, in the, in the athletic program. I'm here because I, I see the kids when I would come to high school, I see myself in them. And there's more, more bad language these days than ever before. And I want to teach these guys and kids that you're not supposed to be doing that. You know, I want to show them that education is important because I've been laid out seven times in my career. And I don't want them to go through what I did. It's hard. And I just want to bring another point, another issue is that uh, I had a, a hard time trying to get a work permit for Tyler. And Trishino helped me greatly. And, and he called Mr. Weston, he was in San Francisco. And I just want to ask if you could have somebody at the front door of the high school open this year, because there's kids that want to work and they have to be going around circles trying to look for that work permit. So if we could have the doors open in the high school this summer for any kid that needs a work permit, I appreciate it very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Abused most of my life, 
in more ways than I care to remember. And homeless in high school left me very rough around the edges. I bounced around from friend to friend. I was no to say my welcome. I'm worried quite rich frequently about where my next meal would come from. Despite my past, my mom never gave up on me. My mom took me under her wing and with her loving, subtle guidance directed me to a scholarship opportunity. I remember the passion in my mom's eyes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, when she spoke to me about this, I had no idea how much this would change my life forever. I'm so glad that I obeyed my mom because I found myself with a scholarship that paid my college education in full. I graduated 18 months later with a degree in the medical field. Yes, I went to a trade school. I deeply thank my mom for knowing what was what the best was for me because I would have never made it in a community college or a university. I know that for a fact because my last attempt was last semester. <laughs> I, know, I do not know where I would have ended up if my mom had not been so devoted to her students and school. I hope I made you proud. <laughs> Thank you, Mom, for being a sticker about good grammar and proofreading <laughs> because it came in handy today. You're always led by example with your honesty, respect, perseverance, and humbleness. The passion in your eyes to help the students at Fillmore is as vibrant as the day I first met you. I love you, Mom. We beat the odds together. I'm speaking to you about a letter to the editor that was published in the April 2nd Fillmore Gazette, which contains many false statements. I will only address those pertaining to the 2008 WASP events. I am speaking because those few others who know the true story are either unavailable or are not in a position to speak. The statement that Mrs. Karen Asham was responsible for postponement of the 2008 WASP visit is false. Reasons for this po postponement had nothing to do with Mrs. Asham. The statement that Karen Asham was denied the assistant principal position by Mr. John Wilbur is false. She received a glowing recommendation from Mr. Wilbur. She was ranked as the top candidate by the interview committee. The previous assistant superintendent of personnel made the decision to hire Mrs. Ellen Green. The statement that, that Karen Asham acted unprofessionally after not being selected for the assistant principal position is false. Mrs. Asham accepted that decision graciously and continued to work hard as a senior counselor for helping the students of the class of 2009 prepare for graduation and submit college application. She also continued to assist and advise in WASP preparations. The statement that Karen Asham left the WASC accreditation preparations in shambles is false. Mrs. Asham used her previous experience as a WASC coordinator, WASC coordinator to help Mrs. Green's preparation for the 2008 accreditation visit. The groundwork that Mrs. Christine Shefferly and Mrs. Asham prepared before Mrs. Green arrived was instrumental in completing another successful six-year accreditation. Finally, Karen Asham's right to privacy was violated. 
The fact that she applied for and was not selected for the assistant principal position is protected information. This information should not have been submitted for publication without her express permission. Finally, the school board may wish to determine the original source of these false statements. concerned about this because I believe that photography, especially in this day and age of digital film, digital manipulation, is a foundation skill. And I think it's one of the few skills that our students are actually going to be taught that they can go out and use on the marketplace. It is a fungible skill. And I can tell you this from my own experience. I, my education is in art. Uh, has nothing to do with film whatsoever. I had a very successful career for a long time. Part of the reason for that was because of programs that I learned, programs that I embraced, the fact that these students are able to go into a film, a computer lab, and manipulate images, learn about how to store, how to um, how to convert images, how to deal with resolution, how to deal with codecs, how to deal with manipulation of images, how to tell stories digitally. This is very important material that they're learning. Aside from the basic idea that um, what you're doing when you're teaching one of these programs, it's an art program basically, but what you're doing, it's also a technical program, but what you're doing is you're teaching them creativity, you're teaching them problem solving. And to me, that is a foundation skill. It's something that's really important. So I understand that you know budgets are stressed and that this is a very difficult decision for all of you. But I would like to say that I think that um, the computer lab in the photography department is probably one of your most important keys to your students' success. They should all be taking this. It should be an integral part of the curriculum because I can tell you that these are fungible skills. This is something that they can go out and they can make a living with. It's something that they can build upon. The fact that they will not be terrified when faced with a problem of how to convert this image from uh, a JPEG to a, you know, whatever else you want to convert it to is going to be significant in their lives and it's very important. And the fact that they might be able to tell their story, to present their ideas through photography would be very, very important to them in the future. Thank you. Newman. I uh, teach art at San I do the art program at San Caetano Elementary School and I have taught art at various schools in different programs for going on uh, 25 years or more. Um, I'm talking in that regard and uh, that my son 
is a graduate of the, the Fillmore High School and has been to the, the Fillmore School District. I also am addressing the shutting down, or the potential shutting down of the photography program at the high school. And I feel this is a huge mistake. And also an expression of the general undervaluing of the arts in public education. Not particularly this school, but everywhere. Everywhere you see arts programs and programs associated with the arts, including music, theatre, as being undervalued and not seen as being important as part of a person's education or valuable. My, my son, as I said, is a graduate of Fillmore High School. He went through the photography program with Mr. Plumel. On leaving Fillmore High School, he went to Moorpark College. While at college, he worked, he worked for the Jostens yearbook, if you heard of Jostens. He was hired from the photography program in the high school because of his abilities uh, to manipulate images, as Lois was speaking about. He then went on to Moore Park College and was hired uh, out of Moore Park College in his second year to work on the Men in, uh, Men in Black, Person in Black movie, and has since worked constantly, practically non-stop, in movies. Um, he is now 39 years old and has moved from that early beginning and is now on his third production design credit. Uh, he is um, he is a very valued production designer in Hollywood and works with on large productions, not small productions, some of the major releases of which everyone here will have heard of. But he went through the photo, the photography program in Fillmore High School and got his grounding there. Um, he, as I said, he's a third time production designer and has two movies lined up waiting for him already. I'd like to remind the board, because it's very dear to my heart, the importance of the arts in education. The arts are the content of our lives. We go to work, we do what we may or we may, may not enjoy to earn our livings, and then we go home. We go home to houses which were designed by architects. We drive in cars which were designed <coughs> by designers. The engines were designed by mechanical engineers who had to have abilities within computer programs. We fly aeroplanes which were designed, the interior of them were designed. We listen to music on our iPads, the iPads were designed. We watch TV, our TVs, everything in our house, our furniture, our wallpaper, the colors of the paint were designed. The contents of the TV, the programming, had art directors, were written by writers, had music backgrounds, all involving the arts. This is what we come home to. This is what we spend our money on after we've been out doing the boring stuff. We want, to, we, want, we want some fun, we want relaxation, we want we want to fill up our lives again and feel renewed, and we do that through the arts. We do it through music, listening to music. Someone has to make it. We watch movies. Movies are moving pictures. They are pictures, they are photography that moves, they are stories. Someone does, has to put that together. Only a few years ago, movies were the third largest producer of wealth in California. That is after aerospace and agriculture. It was movies and entertainment. It is a significant um, source of income to this state. It's a, source, a significant source of income in society. And our children, who are being taught the basis of arts in the schools, are being given potentially this, a career, or one of many career directions, but a career direction. We have, everyone here is wearing clothes. 
Clothes were designed by someone. We wear shoes. Shoes were designed. We have eyeglasses. Designed. Jewelry. Designed. Everything we touch, if you remove everything from our lives that was touched by an artist or a designer, we would be living in the streets, but the streets actually were designed by people, <laughs> and we'd be living in a cardboard box. Not Except we wouldn't have a cardboard box because someone designed it. <laughs> <laughs> designed it. I'm saying that we must value the arts. It's not just someone going out and painting a pretty picture or strumming to themselves on the guitar. It is an integral part of our lives. And it is important. It is important to offer that to the students of the high school and the students of Fillmore that they can use that because there are so many professions which will, even, even a boring profession, they have to now know how to do a presentation. They are expected to, to put forward uh, multimedia presentations to sell things. Advertising, I could go on and on. I, was, I will stop. I think we have a message, Virginia, so thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would be glad to introduce it. As the board knows... Uh, Michael, just a second, okay? If there's anyone that wants to leave right now, then it's probably best to do it right now. Then again, if any of you that want to stay, please do. You might want to move up a little bit. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take a five minute break. Okay, item K, informational item, the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium Test Preparation. Michael? Yes, first of all, I'd like to apologize to the President of the Board. All I said before the break was to introduce the item and to clear the room. <laughs> <laughs> The power you have, the power you have. <laughs> As I mentioned, uh, SBAC stands for Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium, is one of the two groups that uh, have been tasked with preparing the assessment for Common Core. California has joined that particular consortium as opposed to the park. The park consortium is one that has been given the responsibility to prepare the uh, Common Core assessment for states that have a connection between testing and teacher evaluation. And those states that do not have that practice uh, have joined the SBAC, and California is one of those states. As you know, this month and part of next month, we will be piloting the SBAC uh, third grade through eighth grade and then in the eleventh grade at the high school. And I would like the board to know uh, in this report what we have done in preparation for this pilot. I think it's very significant to note uh, how much hours have been logged in uh, in order to get our schools ready uh, for this pilot. Because we believe that this is a precursor to the actual test that will be given next year, which will eventually count. The result of this SBAC pilot is not going to be published anywhere. Districts are not going to be given the results. But we wanted to take it seriously because 
this will provide us ample information as to how ready we will be next year. And so this report will cover two parts. One is the preparation of the area of infrastructure, hardware and activity, all of that. And then the second piece is the preparation in terms of the actual test itself, which involves the teachers and the students. In both areas, uh, our staff and Ed Services have really done, I would say, a miraculous job. Uh, and I would like the board to note that as you hear the results of their efforts tonight. I would like to start with the, the infrastructure, uh, which will be led by Mr. Mike Pace. And then the second piece will be the testing side of it, where the students interact with the test materials. And that will be led by Ms. Amber Henry. Uh, and I would like to start with Mr. Mike Pace. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, good evening, board members, cabinet. My name is Mike Pace, I'm uh, with the Information Technology Department. And I prepared a presentation, a very short one, just to uh, give you an overview of what we've been doing the last uh, few months or so. I'd like to talk about the computer purchases that we've made. Um, we've narrowed the focus of this presentation, of course, to just the aspect. Uh, we've set up many labs. We'll discuss the uh, infrastructure and configuration of these labs for testing. Uh, there's been a major Windows 7 upgrade to computers district-wide, and uh, we're going to compare what we've done with that upgrade to the SBAC requirements. Also, a uh, quick look at the scheduling and uh, then some closing items. There were 151 new Dell computers uh, that we purchased that were deployed. Uh, these new uh, are for staff and it's district wide. It's not uh, specific to any one site. Uh, there are 25 that have remained to be uh, installed. They're staged and ready to be installed. Uh, we've also purchased 256 refurbished computers, which have been deployed and distributed to all sites in the labs. Um, most of the funding from the purchase of these computers uh, were by the, the uh, Common Core State Standard funding that we received and a private donation was made, substantial private donation. Um, we've added uh, the, to these school sites these various uh, hardware installations. Uh, we've added data drops to uh, these uh, five schools, the high school, Pyro, Sierra, Mountain Vista, and San Cayetano. Uh, we've added electrical to Pyro. We've also added tables with cable management trays so that uh, people won't be crawling over cables uh, within these labs to these schools below Rio Vista, Mountain Vista, San Cayetano, and Sierra at the uh, high school. Now, in the configuration by site, we've set up, as a minimum, each elementary school has two full labs, and within each lab are 37 desktop computers. In the middle school, we have uh, set up three desktop computer labs and one laptop lab, the laptop lab being the wireless lab. In each of those labs is a minimum of 35. Sierra, we've upgraded the Sierra lab from 16 computers to 24 computers. The high school, we have four active computer labs. Two of these labs have 40 desktop computers. Two other labs have a minimum of 36 desktop computers, and we have a fifth lab in process to be constructed for 40 desktops. We're waiting for the security installation on that one. And once that's in, it's just a matter of a day or two uh, to install the computers and set that lab up. Windows 7 upgrade, as everyone may have heard, the XP operating system, which this school had a majority of at the time I came on board a year and a half ago, uh, well, that support has, been, has ended by Microsoft. Um, we have enrolled in a Microsoft-provided uh, product called the Enrollment for Education Solutions. And what that does, it provides us 
with a substantially less cost means of licensing the new workstations, or any workstation for that matter, um, dealing with the Windows 7 upgrade. Uh, not only in the operating system, but this product also provides the Office, Microsoft Office products, which we install Word, Excel, and those things, including a publisher. And we've deployed this uh, upgrade district-wide. Now with the requirements, um, SBAC, uh, our concerns mainly, primarily, are the workstation capacity of the labs and the capacity of the data network as it exists to handle the um, operation, so to speak, of, of being able to communicate with the internet uh, and to uh, speak to the SBAC uh, servers, which my understanding are in the Chicago area. So with regard to the operating system and the hardware requirements, this is a portion out of a SS Smarter Balance uh, Assessment Course Consortium uh, document, which under the Windows operating system, we have the Windows 7 recommended, uh, and the minimum uh, requirements for one gigahertz processor and a one gigabyte RAM, uh, we've exceeded that. Many of the computers uh, that we have, uh, the older ones have the 80 gigabyte hard drive, but we have substantially more hard drive space. So we have exceeded the requirements for the workstations. With regard to the data network, the LAN and the WAN and the internet, the state has provided what, is, what they call a technology readiness tool. And with that calculation, they say, okay, your system will work under these parameters or it won't work. The parameters that we use were a thousand workstations. With our internet bandwidth that we have existing at this time of 100 me megabits per second. And as the comment says, we greatly exceed that requirement. So with those numbers, we should function well in the testing process. One other issue is that we had a measure of our system performance with a complete test of all the workstations in the data network for two weeks with the practice test that, it, uh, that we had after spring break and uh, those two weeks prior. Now with our scheduling, we were concerned with our data network system load to make sure that the sites uh, spread out over the six week period of the testing, which has been scheduled between April the 7th and May 16th. And also we are uh, concerned about recovery of any interruptions of service, two of which we have no control over, Edison as the electrical provider and the county as our internet service provider. However, we have uh, direct control of the district network hardware, so we're constantly monitoring that and making sure that the systems are available and capable of doing the job. And what I have here, I've uh, scheduled out uh, the use of the labs on a per day basis over the period of the testing. This one sample that I have is from April 22nd of the schedules that the principals have, prov have provided. And as you can see, there's probably nine uh, positions there, nine labs will be used on that day the black line at the bottom says that that is the loaded, the lockout period basically of when we will be doing testing and with a little gap around noon. And this is one of the heaviest days that we'll see. Now in the case of uh, the high school in Sierra and the sixth grade at the middle school, they've already had their testing at this point as scheduled. There will be makeup tests later in that period, around the 12th of May, <coughs> primarily. So in closing, um, we discussed the installation of the computer workstations and what was required to get that all that done. Um, the upgrade of the operating system from XP to Windows 7, and we're still in the process of completing that. We haven't uh, completed all of it. What we have registered now is approximately 25% of the computers that we know that are out there, their school district property still need to be upgraded. So we still have uh, work in that area to do. The labs are operational. We have 
all these labs available for students. And the labs are reliable because we have extra computers in the labs in case one breaks down in the course of the testing, it'd be easy to transfer the student over to the next one. They could sign on there and continue with their, um, with their test. With regard to the data network capacity and the uh, that uh, calculation I showed earlier, uh, SBAC is telling us that uh, we have the capacity to do it. And on a department-wide basis uh, with the IT department, uh, we are, our goal is to be responsive to the students and to the staff and to the teachers, and making sure that the operation of the system is maintained and maintained well. And that completes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I just had a question on the, you said I think the sixth graders have already, uh, have already uh, tested in a group in Sierra. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll go over that. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. Sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Pace. And now to talk about the uh, testing procedure itself, uh, the one who has been our point guard in this area, uh, Ms. Amber Henry, will be addressing that. Um, real brief, our teachers attended trainings. We had three sets of trainings, one at Fillmore Middle School. All of their staff for ELA and math, all of their teachers attended the training. It was a two-hour training. They had a webinar that they followed along. And what I did for them was they did the webinar on one computer and actually got their hands on the actual technology and were able to facilitate moving around and making sure that they understood what they were doing with that. Um, we had a training here at the district office. Ms. Henry, allow me to just mention that you did okay. hand out this one to the board, right? This is for Every the board. board has a copy. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention that at the end, but yes. yes. You have a copy of this so you can see the visual. But I'm starting at the bottom and working my way up. Um, we also had a training here at the district office. All of the site coordinators for the test ad attended, as well as representatives from the elementary. Most of the elementary sites have a proctor. Some have teachers that will be doing their own proctoring as well. So they were they attended the training. And then again at Sierra High School with Heritage Valley in attendance. And they too received that training. We've had a makeup training for a couple of teachers that didn't make it at San Caetano. And so at this point, all of our teachers are fully trained in the test. There's still a little hesitance. Um, there's some nerves about what do we do on that first day. And I found with everybody that has taken that first session, they've gone through it and realized, oh, that was a lot easier than I thought. Um, what the state has done is they provided so many trainings, an abundance, an overabundance of information of what if scenarios, that it's been hard to fine tune and it actually makes our teachers a little bit more nervous about taking this test. So now that they've gotten their hands you know, in there and they're working and they're realizing how much easier and more smoothly that test system is running. So, um, so far we've had reports of success. If you look on your um, chart here, I'll tell you an update of where we're at. Uh, our sites, if you look at the diagram, and to those in the audience, this will be going up on our website, so you'll be able to see it, um, and I'll update it at the next board, board meeting as well. But if you look at the graph there, 98% of Fillmore High School 11th graders have finished their test. That's down to about two students that are left with little pieces of the test to finish. At Sierra High School, there are 11th graders. 29% of the tests are done there at Sierra High School with those 11th graders. At Fillmore Middle School, they just started with sixth grade the last two days, and they're, we're at 2% of their tests updated. This um, data recycles every night, so actually, I have that feeling that number's a little bit higher, because when I did this at four o'clock this afternoon, um, more data was uploaded into the system. Mountain Vista, we have 14%. That's half of our, no, I'm sorry. All of our fifth graders have started and half of our third graders have started at Mountain Vista. And the remaining sites will be starting. Um, Mount Rio Vista and San Caetano will be starting next week. And Piru will start the week after. So we're kind of slowly um, building our capacity as we go through this and, and increasing what bandwidth we are using a little at a time. Um, we have 5,921 tests to give in this district. Every student has either three or two tests to do, an ELA, a math, and a performance test. So of those tests, we still have 4,781 tests to go in our district. So we still have a long way. Um, this is our first week of tests. So first full week, it's been one week now. So I will keep you updated as we go along. But so far, no major glitches. We've had minor things occur and contacted the state, and they're on it. Um, one incident at Mountain Vista was just a couple of the computers froze on the students, and then the system, the Smarter Balance system, wouldn't let them log back in to take the test. So I contacted the state, and they're on it. They immediately are returning phone calls and um, making us a priority. So it's going pretty smoothly, I have to say. Thank you. Any questions? Just, just a comment that.
this is an extremely difficult task. And what we're looking at is how can we prevent any hiccups from happening. And that takes a lot of planning and a lot of work. And to make sure that we are not shy with the equipment necessary for our students to be able to be assessed correctly. We are also in the process of having a just-in-time computer inventory. A lot of times what happens, in the middle of the week something will go down and you have to wait to order something. We want to have something already there. So all you have to do is come and pull out the old one, put the new one in, and we don't lose a step. And that's how we have just-in-time inventory like we have just-in-time purchase. We don't want to have a whole lot of inventory because that costs a lot of money. We also might talk about more than we need. What we're trying to do is make sure that we grow into what we have because we know it's going to happen. Irrespective of what we think is currently necessary, we will need more. So we're trying to get ahead of the curve and make sure that everything happens, we are already prepared for that to happen. That's why as soon as we get the, the uh, network operating center done, so they call it the knock, as soon as we get that ready to go and fully have it fully loaded, I think I'll feel a lot better and I think everybody else will. The piece that's so important that we have with Amber is that she's the one that can tie the technology to the instructional asset that happens. When we first started doing technology, we had a lot of, I think personal mind, but a lot of techie nerds. And they knew technology, but they didn't know how to integrate it into the classroom. And unless it works well in the classroom, it's basically worthless. So we're trying to mar marry both of those so that our kids will be ready to move on. And I think someone brought that up today. So I do congratulate Amber and my department for all the work that you've done to get us here. It is not an easy task. Thank you. Thank you. Allow me to add also, Dr. Nishino, that uh, I'm reminded of, uh, I think it was Churchill's Second World War, the mandate of the Royal Air Force. He said, never has so few done so much for so many. I'd like to mention to the board that it really is nothing short of miraculous for them to have gotten us ready and prepared for this task. And you're talking about four people, three in the tech department and Amber in at services dealing with the testing aspect of it. Now, I'm not going to be around here to advocate for this particular piece. But keep in mind that we've added hundreds of computers in our district to each elementary school, four at the middle school, and perhaps five at the high school. Now, those equipment, as you know, will experience obsolescence. Not only that, we also need to look at maintenance. Not only uh, the desktop computers, but also the connectivity involved in it. The board really needs to think, at some point, taking a look at personnel in that area, taking a look at how we can maintain and sustain what we have. Otherwise, we're going to fall back behind again and it's going to be very hard to catch up. Our students deserve the best in front of them. Not to mention the wireless connectivity that we really need to seriously consider. Because more and more, e-books are being considered, not only in California, but across the United States. And therefore, that would impact our technology capability. And so, just planting the seed, the board's mind, to please take a look at our personnel and technology, take a look at our personnel and our services, because we keep expanding our resources and our capability, we need to make sure that we can support it. Or else, it's going to be a mess. I remember three years ago when I was called in, number one on the plate was technology in this district until we were able to bring in Mr. Pace, and things began to settle down. Now we're in a period where we are almost there, but in no time 
are we going to fall behind unless this is seriously considered in the future? I just want to remind the board of that. Thank you. I have a question, Michael. Yes. Um, Virginia and I were at a meeting with elementary teachers a few, five, six weeks ago. And, and this was a concern that we were spending a lot of money in computers, in labs. What was going to be the outcome? And you, you, you answered my question. You're, you're planning, you're planting the seed for us to make sure that we can maintain what we have and, and go just and go beyond the maintaining. Maintenance is kind of simple in my book. It's moving forward and setting up the the structure and the apparatus in order to accomplish what we want to accomplish in technology. I mean, we were criticized when Andrew was hired. We were criticized when Mr. Pace was hired for their positions. And yet, personally, I know we're going to need more. We're going to need more Ambers and more Paces. And are, are we, right now, between now and the next two, three, four weeks, preparing a budget that will suffice just to get us through the next couple of years? And do we need to do that with you and Dr. Machino, or do we need to do that with the new superintendent not coming on until July 1st? And July 1st is gonna, it's gonna come around very quickly. And that's only um, two, six, eight, maybe eight, 10 weeks. In response, we yeah, in response to that, um, you know, Dr. Michoud and I have talked about making sure, and he's given me the charge, make sure that before I leave and he leaves, we have prepared the district for the new administration coming in. We do know that it will take some time for the new administration to get up to speed. However, things need to move on. And so before I leave, Dr. Nishino has directed me to make some recommendations to the board, number one. Number two, that will happen by way of the LCAP plan. Uh, because the LCAP will outline some of the priorities we have in the district. And one of them already pointed out by the ship's uh, stakeholders is in the area of technology. And as we prepare to develop the section three of the plan, we will fold in, stretch over a three year period, what we believe to be the needs of the district. That can always be reviewed by the administration coming in, change and tweak it. But the convention coming in needs to have some kind of a blueprint based on our experience this past three years that would at least guide them. And then it's up to them to take a look at it and see the finances available, see what the priorities are, and see what the needs are. So the answer to your question is yes. In the next two months, as we develop the LCAP, and you will see it uh, as I presented, which is the next one after the uh, the profile and strategies for non potential non graduates, uh, where it will fall in place. Thank you. Okay, um, on behalf of the board, though, uh, Mike, we'd like to thank you and your staff and Amber very much. I know it's been a lot of hard work, I know we've got a lot of computers, and so uh, thank you for, for all that. Gil's up there as well. Gil. Jay. 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 When will we get this stuff done? <laughs> okay, um, under section K, item 2, profile of potential non graduating seniors and strategies to address deficiencies. Michael, I guess that goes back to you again.
Uh, the board has had, and rightly so, a concern about seniors who may not graduate the end of the school year. Uh, there has been a conversation about the number of those seniors, and so the board has requested that an update be given to the board. And so this presentation is one that will focus on the profile of and strategies for potential non-graduates. There are three main areas I will be addressing tonight. One is I'd like to present a profile of the potential non-graduating seniors. I think that is crucial to understand why they are in the predicament they are in. Present a summary of the real issues facing these seniors. And then present the strategies that have been implemented to address those issues. Because if I'm a member of the board, not only am I interested in knowing the statistics, but what are you doing about it? What have you done about it? So that's what I'll be addressing in the third point. In addition to that, I would also like to address some of the statements made at the last board meeting because it impacts this presentation. It appears to me that there were some inaccuracies in that presentation, and there were, they fall into three areas. And I quote uh, the statements that were made, that nothing has been done since spring of last year to address the issue of non-graduates. And it appears to me that that statement uh, is as follows. After exhausting the path through the chain of command, I presented that information to the school board in the spring of 2013 and again in the fall. The implication is that that has not been addressed at all and continues to be not addressed. Again, maybe I, mis I misunderstood that, but that's how I took it. Second, the policy of not allowing two math classes remains. It was a statement made, the policy of not allowing two math classes at the same time remained in place, and I quoted that from the statement made. Thirdly, that this issue was due to the Algebra II math requirement. I have been told that 58 seniors are in danger of not graduating for not meeting the math requirements. So I will be addressing each of those areas. There were other statements made, but again, these are three I think that are crucial to take a look at because it impacts directly the presentation that I have for you. Again, you know, I, I don't know uh, if they're a misunderstanding of the statement made or the implications made, but at the moment, that's how I interpreted what was said at the last board meeting. Profile. The counselors at the high school sent the board, and the board got copies of it, of the profile of uh, 56 seniors who are potentially in danger of not graduating. Uh, I received a copy of it. I was going to put it up there, but unfortunately my copy has the names of the students. So what I'm going to do is summarize the data on this particular sheet. Five still have to pass Cahesi Math and or ELA. Math requirement in the district, we are requiring three years of math. Out of 56, based on the statistics given by the counselor, 17 need one year of math, 10 need two years, six need three years. ELA requirement, we require four years of English. 16 need one year, nine need two years, and two need four years of English. Other courses required in the 16 of them in addition to math and ELA. 11 need one more course, five need two, two need three, one need five, and two need nine. And we're talking about this year in order for them to graduate. GPA, thought it might be interesting for you to note, out of the 56, 19 
were below 1.99. 35 between 2.0 and 2.74. And two between 3.0 and 3.43. So you've got uh, uh, a bird's eye view of the statistics out of these sheets. Now what I did is I took the letters that were sent out. And uh, out of the letters that were sent out to those seniors who were in danger of graduating, I was able to pull out 52 transcripts. And I personally handled those transcripts. No one else got the data for me. I looked at them. Just so you know, my background, 10 years principal high school, and two years as a counselor. So that helps in looking at you know, transcripts and studying them and trying to figure out what's going on. Out of the 52 transcripts, which are included in the 56, I was able to look at 16 who were able to catch up in the 12th grade, okay, this 12th year, 12th grade year, needing only 30 or less credits second semester. I'm assuming that they will make it. So I pulled out 16, and therefore remaining is 36 transcripts that I still had to take a look at. And here's what I discovered. Ninth grade, you required 60 credits to be successful as a ninth grade. Eight earned 20 to 35 credits. 25 earned 40 to 55 credits. Three, 60 plus. That's when the 52 kids were in the ninth grade. Now if you look at that, you will find out, you know, it doesn't take too long, that these kids were already behind the eighth ball in the ninth grade. I looked at their transcripts in the 10th grade. 10th grade, 120 credits required to be on track. Two earned 55 and below. Seven earned 60 to 85 credits, 13 earned 90 to 100, and 14, 105 plus. So a lot of them were still behind credit, yes? So being the only non-teacher, <laughs> is, this, is this saying that I'm mean, the only non-teacher? Just if you fail, if you fail, yeah, yeah. No. you look, look at analysis of 52 30, transcripts, no. you need 230 credits to graduate. What? Okay, 230 credits to graduate. Virginia is not the only non-teacher. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well that's true. But you, had, but you, had. <laughs> you, you need 230 credits to graduate from high school in our district. Okay, a class is 10 credits a year, five per semester and five second semester if you're taking an English class in the ninth grade. Okay? So you earn 10 credits if you're successful in English nine in the ninth grade. Now if you're taking a science course, you earn 10 credits also. So in the ninth grade, first semester, if you are successful as a student with six classes, which you normally take, you will have earned 30 credits per semester. Second semester, if you continue with those classes and you're successful, then you will have earned 60 credits. Okay. And same thing in the 10th grade. You've got a potential of earning 60 credits again, and so forth. And by the time you get to the 12th grade, in order for you to graduate, we require that they've earned 230 credits. Helps? Helps. Okay. So now, when we talk about ninth grade, 60 credits to be successful, that means they successfully completed six classes. Out of the 38, or 36, eight of them earned 20 to 35 credits at the end of the ninth grade. In other words, I took all 52 transcripts and I went back to their ninth grade year. And then looked at their 10th grade year and then looked at 
the 12th grade here, because this is crucial. This is it. Okay. So what I'm showing here is that these kids were already behind the eighth ball in the ninth grade. And when you fail a class, especially if it's a required class, you be taken the following year, guess what happens? You now are out of an elective. Okay. Now you're behind 10. You have to catch up. So the more classes you fail, the more behind you, be, you get, and the more now you have to double up in the 12th grade to catch up. And you'll see that that's what happened with these students. And when they came, remember in the fall, they came and they were talking about, I'm doubling up in math, I'm doubling up in X, Y, and Z. This is what happened. So in the 10th grade, it's never, it's never because a class isn't taken, it's always because they fail a class. It's always because they fail. Now, when they fail a class and they retake it the following year, now they fail to take a class right. that they normally would have taken. Okay. So now it compounds because by the time they get to the 12th grade, they're trying to catch up. So in the 10th grade, 120 credits. Two earn 55 and below. Now you need to have 120. Two, five earn, two earn 55 and below. Seven earn 60 to 85. 13 earn 90 to 100. 14, 105 plus. Again, they continue to be behind as a group. In the 12th grade, this is most serious. Okay. Keep in mind, in the 12th grade, you can only earn 60. That means if you're behind, you have to find out a way to catch up and take more classes. Within our school or outside the district, wherever? Some, wherever you can do it. Wherever you can do it. Now, it used to be that they would go to Ventura mm -hmm. College. Now, last couple of years, well, last year in particular, the superintendent was successful in negotiating a contract with advanced academics. Mm -hmm. And we were able to offer catch-up classes for those kids in the summer. And we continue to do that so they can double up in the fall. Wow. Yes. Can, can we just dump them over to Sierra? Now, I use that word very strongly because, I mean, in the past, isn't that something that we would do? We would just, well, if you're short in credits, just send you over to Sierra. Make up the credits, you know, slam bam, and man, you've made up five, ten credits in, in, a, magi in a magical seven weeks, six, eight weeks. Well, but what I'm saying is, do you want me to respond? We, to we could easily <laughs> take students that are failing, students that are not in the in a, in their program progressing like they should be, and what we're doing is we're trying to find ways to enable them to graduate. Give them the easy classes. Give them the simple classes. Find a simple way so that we can graduate these kids. And I, and I feel that that is not educating kids. I, I will be touching on that a little bit with a few slides that I have. So the 12th grade, second semester, this second semester, okay, I looked at their transcripts. 20 students missing 32 to 45. Now keep in mind, you can only earn 30 second semester. And that means you now have to double up. And if they're missing 32 to 45, okay, that's more than 30 that they can finish. So they're doubling up. 50 missing 50 to 90 out of the 52. And one missing 130. That student's not going to make it. Okay. What I'm trying to point out to you is that we have had a problem, not only with this class, and I'll show you the classes now in the ninth grade, 10th, 11th, where we are. Okay. Yes? I just wondered, if they started behind in, this, in the ninth grade, were all their parents contacted or um, what letters sent home? Because um, I'm sure the parents would figure out if they're already behind, they're gonna, where are they going to pick up the units? Um, because if letters were just sent home with, with the kids, they probably didn't give them to their parents. But um, 
you know, I'm just wondering if we did everything we could, and if we, we didn't, we need to start doing that. Um, it, it's one of the things that I'll be recommending, because we need to look at the systems. Let me say this. We have dedicated staff. And I don't want to imply that because these statistics are very dark, that teachers, administrators don't care. We need to take a look at the systems. And that's what Dr. Nishino has been good at, putting in systems. You know, my wife works in the health area. And occasionally, at Stanford, they would have a case where they would be sued. They look at two things. They look at the system, were procedures in place to prevent this from occurring? Now, if there were policies and practices in place to prevent it from occurring, then they look at the individual. Did the individual overlook it? Did the individual, was the individual trained to do it? So they look at two things. Similarly, we need to take a look at, first of all, the system. Do we have systems? Do we have a process that says, in the ninth grade, this is what you need to do with kids who are behind? Okay, not just a counselor who wants to do it, but that it's part of the system. It's part of what happens. It's required. So no matter whether a counselor is there or not, it is part of the culture. And that's what we need to take a look at. So let me move on. Can I ask a question? Yes. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to. No, that's okay. I'll go back okay. in. I don't mean to look back, but okay. So I want to kind of tag on to Lucy's question. I'm a parent now. Obviously, ninth grade, that's four years ago. Yes. Right? Was that, that's before your time. Four years ago, that's before, before we came here. That's before you came here. Okay, so four years ago, who who would be responsible for sending that letter? Is it the principal? Or is it the counselor? No, it's a counseling the office. That, no, counseling office handles that. Counseling office? Yes. So they would be responsible for? Absolutely. Giving Contacting them. parents, keeping parents up to date in terms of credits and units. Okay. That was part, that's part of, I was a counselor, and that was my role. Okay. That was my role. Yeah, now, they work in tandem with the classroom teachers, ideally, because there should be a contact also, when a student is not performing very well, there should be some contact with the parent from the classroom that says, oops, I'm sorry, things are not going well with your child. So it's, it works in tandem, the classroom and the counseling office. I did not even break down for you students who repeatedly fail the same subject. I didn't even break that down for you. I'm just giving you the credits that they're missing. Is that would have, that's why I, I... Is the bottom line that 36 12th graders or is it still... 36 12th graders. graders, 36 12th graders. So you're not up to 52 anymore? It's no, because I subtracted the 16 out of the 52. Because the 16, I'm very hopeful. They will oh, make it. Because they have 30 or less credits they need to complete this semester. So the bottom line is your remaining 36. And that's how much credit they need to complete this semester. But, but my concern becomes uh, where I'm feeling very uncomfortable is four years ago, this started. Correct. Right, that's what I'm saying. And each year it just kept, it kept going. It, it kept going. And here we are at this point. Absolutely. But this actually started four years ago. Four years ago. That's the point I would like to make. Okay. That's why to make a statement that these kids may not graduate because of a math requirement, that may not be as accurate. Okay. There's a lot more to that story. And that's what I would like to show. May I move on? Yes, sir. Okay. Just real quick. That's a compounding effect that you compound the issue. If you don't take care of it at the front end, you pay for it at the back end. And, and I did talk when I came on board, my, when I came on board, I've had it in every unified school district. The continuation high school said, we feel like we're the dumping ground. And we feel like we have throwaway kids. 
And I said, well, I've had to do this in every place. We probably have to do it here. So we tried to put a system in that said, you have to have the principal of the high school and the principal of the continuation school and the counselors meet together to decide which kids will come to Sierra, to the continuation high school. The goal of a continuation high school, in my perspective anyway, is to get the kids back on track and then put them back into the mainstream. Some kids don't like that, they want to stay in Sierra, that's okay. But the goal, the goal should be to get them in, make up the credits, and get back into the mainstream with the rest of their graduating class. And so we put a system in place, and um, I don't know, Cynthia can talk a little bit about that. What I found out, it really takes a lot of burden away from the continuation high school principal. Because now they can say, this kid has no chance of graduating. They're 80 credits behind the juniors. There's no way we can catch them up. And so let's try to find out which kids we can actually catch up and go. And so uh, that's not just here. That's been in every place I've been. But once you put the system in place, then it seems to alleviate that issue. Because now you have people working together to do the best interest of the kid. Not the best interest of the high school to have higher graduation rate, so they look better on their scores, which was in place in two places I've been in. That you graduate more kids and you, you, your score looks better. Because it's not on test scores alone. It's on the graduation rate. So I think that the system in place will, over time, start to alleviate some of those issues that we have with some of our students. This should not be taking place in any district. We should be able to do something before it becomes this crucial. And I agree with you, Dr. Ashima, as far as Sierra, you know, I mean, I, I mean, that's not our goal is to just move, them, them. Put, no. move them over there. And I think you mean that as well, but it didn't sound like that. So yeah. you need to clarify. We're being facetious because, know, again, no, but it didn't, that has been a practice, that? and it's not a good practice. If we're trying to teach right. the kids responsibility, and to make them understand that an education is important, then you've got to put it on them to a certain degree. They need to take some ownership in their own education and not just make the teachers, the counselors, and the principals completely responsible. And then some of it falls on the parents. The parents have got to take an active role. And too often we just let that go by the wayside. All those seven students, I, I brag on this one because I'm, I'm really proud of this one quick. Let him finish. I'm really proud of this one. Out of the seven kids going down to San Diego, two are from Sierra. And two of these kids, I think Cynthia will, will, will attest to it, are kids that probably were considered throwaway kids back in the day. That they had no chance of making it, so there's no way they're going to be anybody, let's put them over there. They were the happiest kids of the bunch. They, they, they really wanted to make this happen. So I think that, I guess this is part of my other side that I really do work for the underdog. That sometimes we have kids that we don't want to spend enough time with and we just have to do it. And once they get that spark, let me tell you, the SEAL told me this too. I said, we're 80% we're free and reduced. And they said, that's where we want to go. They want to go where the kids have to work hard to make it. They don't want the ones that grew up in a silver spoon and they got everything. They're not the ones that make it. The ones that make it are the ones that had to go through and struggle. So I was really happy when they said they were gonna come up here. I, I, I wanna ask one question. Uh, no name or anything. But is one of those, is one of those students the foster kid? Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. John, John would like to make a comment. John? Go John. Yeah, my, my comment was simply around the, the idea that, I mean, I think that um, while I agree that, you know, some of the things that Tony was saying about, you know, we should, um, I mean, kids help them be responsible for their education. I think one of the reasons why alternative education exists is because not everyone, not everyone is a square hole really fitting into a square peg, you know, with a square peg. Some people will not fit into the standard model of education, and I know for a fact that the kids have been helped tremendously because they've been taken out of the standard model of education. And also, I, I know from my experience in the military, there were a lot of kids that were just not mature enough at age 15, 16, 17 to be able to take that responsibility on. And it wasn't until they went into the military that they actually really appreciated what they had and got the maturity in order, in order to really take education seriously. So. 
I don't want to just say it because kids screwed up in my grade or because they were, you know, uh, in 10th grade or whatever, that, you know, that it's all the kids' fault or it's all the parents' fault. The kids are coming, we're, we're not like China where everybody gets treated exactly the same way. You know, fortunately, we do have alternative paths. So I, I think, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with some of the stuff Tony said, but some of the stuff like, I, I don't agree with. John. Two comments. One about the parents, my experience in this district. You know, it's good that somebody coming in from the outside, you have a fresh look at it. You've got about 35, 40% EL students in the district. You have uh, uh, a district that has been authorized to serve free and reduced lunch to all of its students. That means you, be, you have to have at least 75 to 80 percent free and reduced lunch. So a word about our families. Because of the data we have and the statistics we have, we have many families who do not have the capacity, A, to understand what's going on in the system, and much less engage the system. It is incumbent upon us to reach out to them, not wait for them to come. We need to actively reach out to them. There has to be a system that does that. Okay. That's one. Number two, it is true that we will have some students who are immature for whatever reason, but let me tell you, if I'm looking at this data, and I'm going to show some more data for you, I will be very disturbed at the number. If you have a few of them, fine. But if you look at a huge number, I would say there's something wrong. Again, there's something wrong in the system that perpetrates it. So just those two comments. Let me, may I move on now? Do you know that Michael is engaged in going to be teaching English towards when? Tomorrow? Sorry, I start tomorrow. tomorrow. And you're teaching parents. Parents. One day a week, although they want more than one day. More than one day. Michael could do more than one, but Michael's teaching English to our Spanish speaking parents. So I, that's, 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 and they signed up, they were ready to go, fairly enthusiastic. That's one thing that, you know, on a personal note, I really wanted to happen right away because the parents were interested. My staff in Ed Services, all of our plates are full, and therefore I did not want to pass this on to somebody else and add it to their plate. And therefore, I decided that I need to take this on. Because the parents need to know that they are valued. When we had our first LCAP meeting on that sign, and those of you attended, on that, and Sandy, you were here. I sat right here. Very impressive. That sign, mostly Hispanics. We've never had a turnout like that in this district. Three years I've been here. And I wanted to communicate to them, I thank you for coming. When you raise that need, we're going to respond to it right away. Next slide. So, there are multiple reasons for potential non-graduates. Non-passage of the Kahisi, insufficient credits under 200, too low a GPA under 2.0 cumulative, specific course deficit, 1 to 9, particularly in math, ELA, and other required classes. Class of 2014, if you notice the number, it's 194. If you go back, existing classes this year, they're over 200, 230, 240. Why is this class 194? Let me tell you where they are. 40 of them already have been transferred to Sierra. Out of this class. 40 have been transferred to Sierra. Already. So That's correct. Okay, 40 have been transferred to Sierra, 194, about a quarter of them in danger of failing, not graduating. Issues go all the way back to 9th and 10th grades. If they don't make it in the 9th grade and they're still behind in the 10th, let me tell you, you now have a genuine struggling student. Because the only alternative is for them to double up in the 12th grade. They'll be playing catch up all the time. 
Now, what were some of the strategies we used? When this was brought up in the spring, we didn't ignore it. We didn't ignore it. I just didn't know how deep the issue was. So we offered a summer program for them. 32 attended, took advantage of it. 27 of them made up the math classes. Yes? Absolutely. It was limited to those kids. This, this, is, this is the ones you're talking about? That's the one I'm talking about last summer. Okay. That was never offered. That was online. Dave McDonald was the one who handled that class. I recruited him, okay. you know, based on Dr. Superintendent's recommendation. And we did that to address that. Fall came. It was not enough. That's why you heard the outcry later on. And, and as I look at the data, I said, that's why I said, Every inch of my body was against what I was going to do, but there was no choice. It was so bad that we had to go back and offer them boneheaded math again. There was no way around it. Early fall remedial math and English classes were offered. We brought them back. They went into the master's schedule. Students doubled up on required courses through the Digital Academy, Night School, PASS program, and Auto ROP course. Late fall through late spring, this spring, student-parent contacts were made by the counselors, face-to-face. -face. Letters were sent out. Another batch of letters will go out in April, before the end of this month. Contracts were made, and one-on-one -on -one contact with the principal. They've done a lot. So to imply that nothing has happened is not true. Is not absolutely true. So Michael, um, so it sounds to me like none of this should have been surprised to these students. You're absolutely right. When I met with the counselors two weeks ago, they, and I asked them that question point blank, I said, I don't want, come June, Kids are lining up for graduation, because I told them it will end up in my office. I don't want a long line in my office of parents saying, I didn't know. Okay, they said, yes, we've done the work. Now, you still might have some, but they have done the work that needs to be done to inform the parents, to get their transcripts prepared and ready. For the most part, what's left is, kids who can do it will make it. We'll make it. But you're still, my prediction, double digit, non graduates. Because of the data I have shown you. Again, I'll, 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 I mean, I look at the data and from what the, the, the I saw in the counselor's data, and I know you were this earlier, it seemed to me like out of all the students that were in the nature of not graduating, uh, the vast majority of them had, were really not related to the math requirement. No, it's not. It is much, much more deeper than that. But it's been implied that right. that's, it was, it was, that's what it was implied, right? It was a bunch of different categories. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I'm trying to show. That's why the statements made to the last board meeting, if they were, if I'm interpreting them accurately, if I'm mistaken, I apologize, but if I'm interpreting them accurately, that nothing has been done since spring of last year to address the issue of non-graduates, not true. Not true. That the policy of not allowing two math classes remains not true. Those kids had to double up in math. Even in the summer, I was assigning them consumer math and geometry. They were doubling, they could make it. Thirdly, that this issue was due to algebra two math requirement? Absolutely not. You've seen the data. What happens, however, when we ended up, not by policy, but by default, because we eliminated a lot of the remedial classes, what happened was, all that was left was Algebra 2. Algebra 2 simply shone the light on the issue. I didn't know it. Okay, what was happening when that statement is made is this. We're blaming the light for the roaches in the room. Okay, the light simply shone the issue. When Algebra 2 became the only course they could take, it exposed what was, sit what was the situation in the district. I had no idea. You know what, my, my opinion, that were, turned out to be 
in the long run something good. It, 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 for you to put that in place because, I mean, I wanted that. I wanted that. As I've told you, my story was that I was never offered that in my day. Forty years later, I heard the story of the young lady that it happened to her as well. It made me sick, to be honest, that that would occur again 40 years later. But it's just that, uh, I, I don't even know. It, it, it emotionally, it emotionally gets, it gets me well, that if they're not, if they're not doing this um, credit-wise, I mean, for you to have put that in place, I, I wanted that for them because I want these kids to not have the dummy math. I don't want them to just take the, the easy courses so they can graduate. I want them to have that rigor. I want them to be able to start doing this and it's going to take that for this district in order for our kids to start doing better and be getting into better college. Well, well they, they get into colleges but it's just better for them I and mean, we know that. I mean anybody that says it's not, I, I, I would disagree with completely but but if, if that was there, if anything, if it exposed the fact that they're not, the credits weren't there and now all of a sudden they can't graduate because of that, you're absolutely right. But at least it's making us now look at that and then hopefully put something in place that won't allow this to occur. Something has to happen. I mean, I, I don't know what that is. I mean, if you, if you send a letter and the parent doesn't respond or the, the student doesn't refuses to do the work or doesn't do the work, I, I don't know what it's there. But I mean, but we can't continually um, we have to do this for the kids that are, it's there. It's up to them to grab it if they want it. That's our, I feel like that's our job. Our job is to give it there to you. We're giving you the opportunity to go to college or, or do whatever it is you're going to do in your life. You need to look at this and, and run with it. But I don't know. I see that as, as our job for them. And um, I mean, everybody here can disagree. I, I don't know, but that's how I feel. Virginia, I think uh, one of the things you thought of that, that I think made me think right away was, okay, so here we are, you know, we, we kind of found that there was an issue here at the beginning of the year, but it was, I think it was about 58 students at the time, it was, it was a 50. So I guess rather than wait until the beginning of the year, why don't we identify the sophomores and juniors that are in a similar situation so that they're not in this position mm -hmm. when they're seniors? Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what Michael's saying that we need to do, to do something to put something in place. He and Dr. Cushino, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the next slide I'm is sorry. really one. Yes. I'm sorry, Michael. Can I'm I just sorry. get one quick comment oh, yeah. here? Two quick points. First of all, I agree with the Algebra 2 requirement that the scaffolding has to start in middle school putting students where they need to be, not pushing them further ahead because then they do not understand. I'm sorry, I can't hear the speaker. She's not on the microphone. She's going to have to use the microphone. Here, come yeah. on. Oh, there you go. I agree with Virginia that you need the uh, Algebra 2 requirement, but you have to start back in middle school. Correct. You cannot push these students too far, too fast, or they do not understand the class. Just because they have passed Algebra 1 does not mean they understand the concepts. Second of all, why has the light just been turned on now? I don't understand why this wasn't known years ago. I'm, okay. oh, I'm a high school freshman. I'm totally blown away by this fact that this is the first time it's been addressed. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, maybe I'll I'll speak to that. The, the next slide for me was the most emotional one as I was preparing this, uh, because it really presents a sense of urgency for the district. Concern about algebra two, no equal concern. Here's where I really got very emotional. When the issue surfaced in the fall, the board meeting was packed. Parents were saying, we want our kids to graduate. Algebra two is not going to make it for them. They're going to fall farther behind. Agree. The newspaper, local newspaper picked up on it, also sided with, it should be gradual. Agree. But there was no equal outcry that those students graduating this year will get a piece of paper that does not say what it says.
it doesn't prepare you for anything substantial in the future. There was no equal I cry. I would have been moved if somebody said, I want my child to graduate, you should have gradually introduced it. But at the same time, I was waiting for one parent to come to me and say, I am angry just like you are. Why are we graduating these kids with a piece of paper that doesn't mean anything? Secondly, this has been the case in the past and will continue next year, in the next few years unless we declare a state of emergency. Let me show you the data right now, right now, the data. 50% of the grade of, of grades 9 to 11 behind credits already. 50% of your grades 9, 10, and 11 are behind credits already. 31% grades 9 to 11 cumulative GPA below 2.0. 20% grades 10 and 11 math deficient. That is a state of emergency, folks. In other words, we're graduating a third of our students with a piece of paper that means nothing. We take care of the top third, I can guarantee you that. They go to good universities and colleges. But we're neglecting a third of our students. No policy has failed these students. The system has failed these students. Not one individual is to be blamed. There's a system set up that is not working for the kids. That's, those are huge numbers. In order to graduate the next two or three years, the students, you're going to have to continue offering remedial courses. I end with this. It's a quote. Julius Caesar, Act 4, Scene 3. There is a time in the affairs of men taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted all the voyages of their lives end in shallows and miseries. What this current administration has done is set the stage for a flood. We've done what we can. The work is unfinished. It's unfinished. You can see it. Much needs to be done. I'm sure the board has made the right choice. The new administration has to be supported. And we're leaving behind enough for that new administration to build on. The opportunity is there and it would be taken at the flood that would lead to fortune and change the future for each of our students in this district. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.
and every and there's so much that is involved in running this school. I mean, it is just amazing. The teachers, all the work that they do, just to prepare for their class. And then you have your counselors, and you have your you have your uh, vice principals, and your principals, and your I mean, going right up the line to the top. What I see happen is uh, people were graduating. You know, for us, people were graduating, and until we got some. Okay, and for me, uh, students students were graduating, and when it, by the time it gets to this level, I mean, we see them graduating, you go and you think. We got two people with pretty vast experience who came in and decided to put that program. That's what opened it up, that these, they, they couldn't, they couldn't, couldn't do it. to be in the schools. That, that won't do it. I don't, that's, that's not going to, I, I was there. I've been there, Kelly. I went through it with my whole, with all my students. The thing is, no, until you, he had to go through their, each individual folder to find that out. That's how he went. Is it, is, am, yes, I, am exactly. I stating it incorrectly? I, 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 I touched those transcripts it's numerous times. That I would be a standard. That should be a standard. Well, that's what we're saying now, but had they not brought that to light, so this how would not be happening. How do we do that? That's the million okay. dollar question. Sorry. Hopefully, I mean, it's, it's obviously come forward and now it's going to be something that, that we're going to talk with the new administration. Hopefully they'll keep it going forward. Thank you. Right, but that, that's, that's, it is now there. And, and obviously this has been very clear, but I take it back. Had they not brought it to light, had this not all happened, it would still be going through, there would still be the graduations and we wouldn't know it. So to me, in the long run, whatever it was, good thing because it opened it up. For me, I'm not speaking for them, I'm speaking for me. But that's how I feel and I just, I don't, I... I, I think that a big part of this is uh, the lack of communication from all different sources and that's one thing I know that we really want to stress for the next administration, you know, staff, parents, you know, the students, they really have to, we really have to focus on that now, so. Did you have a question? Sarah? Well, I was just questioning that there's bulges of kids at times that they, they, they're known to be a lower class or. No, I, I understand that, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I've witnessed that myself, so. Meaning that there's more Sandy, and I agree with you, but. No, I'll just to say, Virginia, I think she means that, you know, every so many years, there, there, there are like, you know, there's a particular class that has so many more students that are that far behind. I understand. Yeah. And I agree but, but there, yeah. are, there are there are classes cycles, like that. It just right. I, right. I understand that. We see that. Right. Exactly. Right. right. But, but the thing is, it's not exactly but for any class now. Obviously, we have an issue here, so we'll have to work on it. Yeah. May I comment on, yes. on part of the process? So I just wanted to point out that uh, what Dr. Nishino and Michael have done is that they have created a systematic approach to transferring students. And those of us that have worked at other districts know that in order to not violate due process of students, with the new law that have come out with AB 1729, you have to provide documented interventions. And to the counselor's credit, the current counselors, Christina Sanchez and Dina Wyatt, they have done an outstanding job this year. They worked extremely hard. <coughs> And as I've stated to them, they are the unsung heroes at the high school because what they have done, they have, as Mr. Johnson pointed out, they have gone through the transcripts. They have notified the parents. And when you look at an issue that is that large, you also have to look at what type of systems are in place in order to look at interventions for credit recovery, interventions for academic behavior interventions, and then looking at what's the viable alternative. Is it an alternative program? Is it concurrent enrollment in another site? And what Dr. Nishino and Michael have done is created that systematic approach to the transfer process. We meet quarterly. We identify students that have to follow a certain criteria that is state required, minimum of 16 years of age, and then looking at the documented interventions. And then these counselors have created a list of priority. Currently, we take in students every quarter, anywhere from five to 16, as we took this last quarter, with the intent to have them uh, do some credit recovery and then return to Fillmore High School or graduate from our site. So I want you to know that there is a there is a strategy and a system set in place for this year and for the last year. And I do understand that there's constantly a waiting list of students because of this deficit. So 
currently there's anywhere from 20 to 40 students that can come to see our high school. If that's what we have, then that's what we have. But what do we offer at Fillmore High School is something that the counselors have constantly asked so that we can put our heads together and that's something that we've been looking at. What can we do together to ensure that our students have interventions for credit recovery? So I just wanted to make sure that the board was aware that there is a systematic approach. Many times people don't understand that process because in the past, students were just transferred every day, anytime. And board members, if you recall, you charged us with uh, restructuring that continuation program to creating a viable, rigorous program. We've done that, but within that, in, in all due respect with my staff, we have to have students transfer at a quarterly process so that they don't disrupt the instructional right. process. So I do want you to be aware that these two counselors have worked extremely hard. And I don't think people understand that, nor do they give them the credit that they, they deserve. And that's just one thing I wanted to point out. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Duly noted. Thank you, counselors. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so obviously that's a big problem that we're going to have to work on. And as some of us are meeting with the new superintendent, those are the issues that we're going to have to bring forth to him so he can start thinking about all that. Okay, uh, the third item, informational item, is uh, the LCAP report. Uh, from this last yeah, that would be mine too. May <laughs> I suggest I, that last presentation took a lot out of me. Yeah, you want to. So I'd like to move that to the next, to the next board meeting. meeting. That I would be appreciated. That would be acceptable. Thank you. So okay. do we have to make a motion to do that? Or no. Uh, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. All right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay, okay for next meeting. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, item L, consent items. Items on the consent agenda are considered routine and will be enacted by a single motion. None of the items will be discussed unless a board member or member of the audience requests discussion. Okay, um, we're talking about items four, four through 16. Do I have a motion? Uh, you want to do four, 416? The well, unless somebody wants to pull an item, okay. this is the consent. Is it not? Yeah. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Thank you, John. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve yes. items 4 through 16 on the consent I items. All those in favor? Aye. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Aye. Oh, do you have one? Okay. Discussion. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nobody wanted to pull anything, correct? Yeah. No, but you no, just to ask for but, the check. Okay, John moved and, and who was at the second meeting? Dave. Okay, and all those in favor one more time. Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay. Is that five zero? <coughs> okay. Motion carried. Okay, now we're at action action item number eighteen. Uh, to approve, uh, to increase all certificated salary schedules according to tentative agreement between FUSD and FUTA. Uh, I need a motion. Who is that? Uh, do I have a second? Okay, I second it. All the, oh, is there a discussion? No. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, any opposed? Okay, motion passed 5 0. Okay, uh, action item number 19. Approve the salary adjustments for all management, classified, confidential, and supervisory employee salary schedule. Okay, I need a motion. So moved. Thank you, Tony. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dave. Okay, any discussion? No? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay, motion carried 5 0. Item 20, approve the notice of completion for Rio Vista School New School Construction, um, Hearthstone Multi Asset Entity. Um, I need a motion. So moved. Oh, go ahead. Tony moved. Are there a second? second. Virginia, thank you. Um, Is there a discussion on this? Yeah, let me let me just add something. If I may, am I just trying to lie? I just need to read a, a statement into the record just so we have it on the minutes. Okay. As you know, the Rio Vista project has been a challenging one for us. It has a, a many players, and what we're trying to do at this point in time 
is to get to a place where we can start closing out some of those issues. And this evening's um, action of notice of completion is one of those administrative things that need to be done as part of the closeout. Uh, however, we still have some issues that um, <coughs> still need to be uh, tied up with uh, the developer Hearthstone. And uh, the approval of the notice of completion by the government board does not relieve Hearthstone of the responsibility of ensuring the completion of the remaining punch list or warranty items and a final um, project accounting and reconciliation. So I just needed to read that statement to make sure that that's in the record, that uh, this action this evening on the notice of completion um, provides uh, another path towards uh, accepting the project and, and allowing a couple of more administrative steps uh, to be completed, but we still have some work yet to be done, and we believe that um, over the next month or so, we'll be able to uh, finally reconcile with Hearthstone on all of the outstanding issues. Okay, thank you, Dio. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to uh, approve this notice of completion for now. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, motion carried by zero. Okay, we have uh, item N, student discipline. Um, we have uh, expulsion case number 13-14. Dash zero nine to an on. Do I have a motion on that? I move to accept staff's re recommendations to expel case number 13 dash 14 dash 09. Thank you, Tony. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Uh, John, since you weren't there, we'll put you as an abstention. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, aye. Any opposed? Okay, so it's four zero with one abstention. Okay, um, item O, future meetings. Okay, we have uh, May 6th, uh, May 20th, and June 3rd, all scheduled for closed session at 5 and regular meeting at 6.30. Um, as of today, is there anyone who foresees uh, not being able to attend? Okay, if not, if you mark it on your calendar, let me know if uh, you're unable to attend then. Okay, uh, item P, board closing comments and agenda building. Uh, so, Michael then will put on that LCAP report then for next time. Okay, uh, is there anybody else? Uh, Dave, I think you, I think you have an item. Yeah, the, uh, the waterproof program comparison. What's that? Um, the waterford comparison? Oh, I haven't got the, the results yet. I'm waiting for the uh, the results of the Rio Vista experiment. You know, the, oh, the learning dynamics. Yeah, the learning dynamics. I'm waiting for that. <coughs> and secondly, I also would like to recommend to the board that we don't only look at waterford. There are other things also right. existing okay, right that's now. Fine. That's okay. That's what I'm And uh, yeah, I have one more item. And I'd like to comment on the uh, LCAP meeting. I thought that went really well. I'm sorry, John, you were abused by your wife. I guess that's just part of being married. So, so, so. Yeah. But anyway, I was pleased with the turnout of the parents, and I like the input. Of, uh, I, I really enjoyed your group. You know, the input of the teachers, I thought, was really super. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Dave. Virginia, do you have any closing comments? Um, or? Yeah, I do. I, first of all, Mike, absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of those young ladies. <laughs> they did such a great job. And um, you've done a great job with them. And I thank you for that. You know, I know you work hard on it and they, it, it shows and you can see the pride in that. And, uh, side note, I was I was migrant just as you were. So just let you know. I, I, I move in that thing as well. Um, I almost feel odd saying this right now because I actually wanted to say this prior, but it's like everybody got up and dispersed and we went into we went into um, uh, a break. And um, but I know it's being built, so I'm I know they're going to look at it. So here it goes. I think I think this is for me. This has gotten very. Um, it's really blown up quite a bit. And 
it's gotten to a point where, I mean, I don't have an issue as far as, uh, what's the word I want to say? I, I don't, I pretty much get along with everybody. And I don't normally, um, gosh, should have had this written in. Where, where I want to go with this <coughs> is, is that it goes both ways. It goes both ways. There are times, so many times, and I've got to say, I practically have to bite my tongue to not just jump out of my skin and say what I want to say because we're not allowed to. But they sit there and it's been going back and forth and this is a lie and this is a lie and this has been saying this. Well, I can definitely, the only one I can, although I can speak to a lot of them that I think were very untrue of things that I read that they wrote down that I know to be untrue, because one of them was written about me. She wasn't even in the room. She wasn't there. What she wrote about me was completely untrue. Do I hold that against her? No, I worked with her. She worked with my children. But none of us are, are out of the thing of making mistakes. And I'm sorry, I mean, I, I know she has helped many, many students. I, uh, all, all of you have. But there's also, Oops, got cut off. I don't know how to answer. Are you there, Mr. Garnica? Yeah, sorry about that. It dropped off at the most inopportune time. I sure did. It threw me off now. <laughs> anyway, uh, what, what I'm trying to say is no matter what and what we're trying to do is, and, and I, I speak for everybody on here, I mean, the emotions run high, and yeah, it, it's hard not to respond. It's hard not to sit there and say that's not true. And, and if, if it was done in the form of the letter, well, it, whether we all agree with it or don't agree with it, Every one of us has the right to write that as long as we do it on our own and what we want to say and what we, it, it's legal. I mean, that we can do as long as we disclose that we're not talking for the board and, and whatever. So, but my, but my thing is that our goal should all be that we're working together to try and bring this district up. And that is, that is what we all are working towards and that is what we want to do. I have not given up 19 years of my life coming in two or three times a month because I want to do harm to teachers, because I want to do harm to counselors, because I want to do harm to anybody. My thing is because I want this, I want this district to succeed. I want these students to have every opportunity. I want them to be as well educated as they can be. I personally, I think this team has been exceptional for us. I think they have brought things to us in three years that we have needed for many years back. And I thank you for that, Dr. Machino, and I thank you for that, Michael Johnson. I thank you for that so much. And I, and, and I, when I make a decision, I make it because I sit there and think, what I want that for my kids. And if I would want it for my kids, I would want it for your kids. And, and I have thought that so many times that I wish my children even without the funding, as with all the starts that you brought us in, I would have wanted them going through with the changes that you were making. So we're embarking on a new, on a new goal, but I will never forget what you've done for this district. I will never forget that. And so there is my comment. Okay. Thank you, Virginia. Tony. John. You have, oh, John. Do you have any comments, closing comments? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, a couple of things. So, so one, I think, Virginia, I agree with you that as board members, we absolutely have the right to respond to whatever we see quite fit. I mean, Tony responded um, in the paper. Uh, you have the right to do that, of course. Um, but I think the public also has a right to, to call out when something is unfair or if something is not correct. And, they have, and, and I think that's one of the things that, that makes us different, Virginia. When we're on the board, we're at, we are the representation of the government. And in the Constitution, 
the the First Amendment says that the people have the right to redress the government. And so when we're acting in that capacity, I think we, we owe um, the people a certain amount of respect. And I think when we, um, as a board or as individuals, step over that line, I, I think it becomes a slippery slope. And so, you know, yeah, Tony has the right to do what he wants. He's, a, he's his own individual. But I think myself and members of the public also have the right to call him out when something is. And I don't, I don't disagree with you on that. They can come and say that, but what I'm saying is that they're coming, they come and they, they sit there and tell us all the wrongs and all the, all the things when we're sitting there listening, and you know, and you know that a lot of those are mistruths. You know that, John. Well, and and, yeah, the, and the thing is, I, but, yeah, right, yeah. they are, but we have to sit here and we have to listen, and I understand that. I, that's our job. I, I signed up for it, I understand <coughs> that. But, what I'm saying is that, but it does go both ways. That, like I said, there are things that they have said that have not been true as well, and yet we have to sit here and listen. And okay, that's but, part but of we what have we have one, to do. Virginia, we, we have one distinct advantage, and that is that we have to bear that in mind. That's that we do know what's going on. See, that's the, true. the difference is the public. The public, because we're not allowed to speak about things that are in closed session, the public does not know what we know, and they can't know what we know. Exactly. So of course they're going to they're going to respond in ways because they they don't have all of the information, and we do. We have to, I believe, act in a way that that fits the position we're in. And so because we do know, <coughs> we shouldn't we shouldn't stoop to the level of name calling. And I and I and I don't and in Virginia, as long as I've known you, you've always stood for treating people respectfully. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not I, saying, I I'm not saying I don't, I'm not saying I don't, John. I don't disagree with you on that. I'm just saying that what I am saying is that I know what, what you're saying and where you're coming from. But, but what I'm saying is whether we agree or whether we don't agree, the legal factor is there for him. I know what you're trying to say, but, and, and I get that. I'm just saying that it's sometimes it's, you feel like you push so much. And, and I don't want to speak to Tony. I don't know why. The he, he can speak for his own self. I'm okay. assuming that you were taken to a certain point, and it, it just, it just like that's it. And done. Okay, we'll just finish up then. We'll just go from there. So, Tony, uh, Lucy wants to move on. Yeah. Any, any comments, okay. Tony? Oh, I, I have a lot of comments, but okay. I'll reserve okay. them at this point yeah. for okay. another time. All right. Uh, it's, but I do want to say that. I can appreciate the teachers from the high school coming in to take their best shot, and they did. They have every right to. If they want to defend one of their past colleagues, that's that's their fun, that's their right too. But as we saw in the presentation tonight, there was some problems that happened about four years ago, and it reflects a little bit on the counseling, the, not the counseling, the, yeah, the counseling department. But let's make it clear, the people, the two counselors that are there now had nothing to do with this fiasco of sorts. And I'll characterize it as a fiasco because certain systems were not in place to take care of the problems that were happening three, four years ago. And so, Sometimes you gotta call them out. And sometimes you gotta be tough, and sometimes you gotta be rough. And if you can't take the heat, then you shouldn't be there. I'm here, I got elected. I expected to take the heat at certain times throughout my career as a board member. And there will be probably more heat that I may take. And I may take more shots, as long as I'm here. But. I have a thick skin, I can handle it, I can take it. I would hope that the others that come and make comments under the, uh, the uh, public comment section of our agenda would at least not taint the truth or speak to half truths and half lies, but at least be honorable enough to explain their position clearly and truthfully. That's all they have to do. But when they come in to play their game, I'll take the challenge. And I have no problem with it. 
Okay. Um, I think we're, we're done. I don't have any comments uh, at this time. And uh, so I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Virginia. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dave. Okay, all those in favor? Aye.